Most of the real activity in all of this, of course, occurred be BC before computers. It started out as the telegraph operators sent, they were on duty on, New, on Christmas Eve over the holiday. They had nothing to do. Nobody was sending a telegram up particularly. So they made up these pictures to send to each other from one telegraph operator to another mm -hmm. around the country or around the world. And they sent them to each other. And that was teletype in those days. And eventually the radio amateurs were authorized to use teletype on the air. And so we started typing to each other. And of course, the minute that meant we got a teletype machine to begin with, right. which meant that we probably had a thing that would punch tape and read tape. And so we found out that these telegraph guys who had been sending pictures for years before we ever got into it mm -hmm. had tapes around in their lockers and God, they were buried. I had them dig them out. You know, I went around and found guys that had them and they would give them to me. I would get the tapes, the originals. And once we got it, we could send it to any other radio amateur anywhere in the world. So it was a kind of an exclusive group, really. Uh, it wasn't the average uh, CB operator or anything like that right. because we had to hook up a machine and figure out how to hook it up to our radio and build the circuits to convert the radio signal to the machine signal and vice versa. Every time you sent one, there were 20 guys out there all punching tapes of it as they received it. And they would then go on the air the next day and talk to their other friends and send them to them. And it just it went on and on. So it just grew like topsy. The, the, the computers have basically wiped it out, you might say. I mean, it, it's, it's no big turn on for a young kid today. A young kid, I don't know how they would get interested in it. You know, they'd say, so what? You know, I, hell, I can do blah, blah, blah with a computer. So that uh, that time is gone. It is incredibly hard to explain to someone the, the entire concept of a community based around dialing up to another computer, downloading files, art associated with it, scenes, the entire concept of a scene. I've, I've tried to explain what ANSI and art groups and the meaning behind it is many times and never once have I been successful at it. I mean, these things are so hard to verbalize, to vocalize, to, to paint this picture of an entire subculture that most people have no idea has ever existed. 
really the more you learn about the, the beginnings of the art scene, the less you want to. It's it's backstabbing and politic. I mean, it's something impossible to explain, only something you can experience. And once you get into the scene, you can actually feel what it's about. There's, there's something kind of archaic but special about it. The dynamics behind an art group is so it's so vast, it's so hard to explain every bit because you had your literature, you had your your your, uh, your telecommunications people, you had the people that were just running the group. It was an organization uh, aimed to create artwork. The ANSI scene is just so huge to try to cover it in one interview. If the definition had to be down to a, a simple one sentence kind of deal, uh, an, an organization of individuals using BBSs to produce and distribute artwork. Making your board individually you was the most important thing. It would, was the thing that would bring people back. It wasn't good enough that they just looked like every other board. I had to be able to enhance them. And even then, content was king. People wouldn't come back to your board if it was the same menus day in and day out, week after week. It, you had to keep the same menu structure because people would get to using it fast, you know, key, 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 when they wanted to go to a particular board. But you would also want to change the look and layout and feel of the thing a little bit because that would keep people interested. It would keep them coming back. And the only way I could do that was to create some sort of art that was able to be transferred across the modem. And that really meant working with ANSI. The software was good that both of was run, but it was really ANSI that uh, accentuated everything and made it look good. There were user groups on CompuServe and everybody pretty much had handles. And I didn't I didn't get this whole handle thing, but I was trying to learn. Um, and I had uh, a friend at the time, later a boyfriend, who called me ebony eyes because I had dark eyes. And when I had to come up with something to, to use immediately, that was what came to mind. When I did my first bulletin board, it was ebony eyes escape. And uh, um, I brought the name with me when I started doing ANSI. And the first thing I found was a very small, primitive little program called ANSI Paint, the very first version of it. And I started playing with it, and I thought, I'm never going to be able to do this. It's these little boxes and things. I'm never going to be able to do this. It took a bit of creativity. It took a leap. Yeah. And before I knew it, I started figuring out ways to, um, to create what, if you stood back a little bit, looked like pictures. You had to kind of stand back a little bit. Um, and that's really always been the case with Nancy. The further back you stood, the better it looked. When I started, I used to start with a central design in the middle and then work out the ends and go back and forth and back and forth. I got to a point where I didn't ever do that. I would start in the upper left-hand corner and I would end in the bottom right-hand corner. And I had an idea of exactly what I wanted and um, I never went back to another line. I would go back a few spaces but I never went back to another line, ever. Unless I was going back to add a signature, pull something out to add a signature or something like that. Because it isn't like you had uh, you know, this high-class HP color laser jet that you could pop them to and just, well, let's just look at it that way. Um, your options were really limited. It was the whole stone knives and bear skins. That's what you were doing. But it was what we had to work with. And it, and it, I loved it. I just loved it.
The very first ANSI that I saw that really amazed me was an ANSI by Chips Ahoy, right? And I was just like, Jesus Christ, this is amazing. At first it was cool, you know, to see colored text, you know, when you first saw your ANSI colored text, you know, that's kind of cool. But then these people took it to a whole different level that I had never seen before. And it, you know, it motivated me because I had an artistic background and I said, you know, how can I contribute to this is basically what I wanted to know. I don't know precisely when they, you know, were formed and who all the founding members were. I just know a few. Um, I know that once I did join, um, I started calling out other boards as I had been doing anyways the whole time, um, all over the world. And I started seeing other people who were doing really good artwork and I said, you know, you should join Ace's Fancy Art. You have very good artwork. They would just basically draw an ANSI for the board and it would stay on that board. It wasn't being sent out other, other places, other boards. That was an unheard of idea at the time. It was kind of like, okay, BBS such and such needs an advertisement. Here you go. Um, and it would be stored on the headquarters site and that site. And that would be it. There would be no other redundancy there. After I joined the group, I would start going around just dialing boards at random. They didn't have to be an elite board. Um, I found a lot of people that were kind of in the, you know, PD-ish type of scene and just said, you know, your artwork is, you know, really good. You need to come join Ace of Fancy Art. This is great what you're doing. It was in September of 1990 that, um, how do I put it? Well, there was a couple things going on. First of all, um, the only two people that were uh, local for myself and the Beholder, and uh, the world headquarters of AAA uh, locked out locals. <laughs> and by accident or not, they locked out members of a group that they were headquarters for. And so that kind of made us go, well, how does this get overlooked? You know? And then we also kind of decided, you know, who's doing all the work for this group now? And it was, it was us. So we decided to form this group. Nancy Creators in Demand just kind of basically kind of popped in my head, you know, we were, think, we were just throwing around ideas and I'm like, hmm, acid, and the name did come before the acronym, of course, um, but it, they both kind of popped in at the same time, and I was on the phone with Grim at the time, he was like, that's it, yeah, that's what we're going to call it. And then ICE actually formed as sort of a response to acid, not, not really you know, just to get acid, but they, it was sort of a second group. And there was really ugly early politics before our first pack. The first ice pack was in um, August of 1992. I probably saw my first ice pack in late 92, which was right after they started releasing, maybe early 93. And that really blew my mind. I hadn't seen an acid pack. And just seeing it, just... Um, you know, it just sort of like made me decide that no matter what, I was going to get an ice. And so that's when I really started doing ANSI seriously. And I eventually had to beg my way into ice trial. Um, I was talking to Metalhead, uh, who at the time was like the, the big ice guy. It was me, Force 10, Tempest Tales, and uh, Lord Mischief. And they all slowly dropped off and I became pretty much the person that was active as staff. And probably for about a year, I was pretty much the person that was active, active as staff and the person making the decision and the, the person dictating what was going on. Um, and then eventually, uh, I brought some other people in and some other people got brought in as some of the older staff members got active again. So I was talking to him, talking to him, trying to, you know, I talked to him on the phone. I was like, you know, networking with him, trying to get my in with ICE. And uh, Christmas Eve of 93 was when he, I gave him a new ANSI. I gave him one that he said was pretty good, and then I gave him this new ANSI, and he said, I remember he said, did you draw this? And I said, yeah. He said, okay, you're a nice. <laughs> so that was, that was how I got in the group. Most people think that the pack concept 
uh, originated in June of 92 because that's when we started doing monthly packs. Acid and Mirage were um, the first two groups to release monthly packs and then maybe four weeks later Ice had one and whereas before you just have a bunch of stray ANSI artwork out there and maybe an occasional report or an interview in a magazine perhaps but um, it was really hard to you know keep things together and keep a collection of things before people started doing you know monthly issues. I think it, it is a very valid statement to compare art groups to a talent show where a bunch of people every month got together uh, put put on an art pack to see who was the best and who had bragging rights on who was the best. Uh, see that was the thing, I never really understood what the competition was all about. It's like who can get the most antsies out or who can cover the most advertisements or was it just who can do the best antsies? For the art scene it was fantastic because you know people would put their all, you know, spend a month working on a new antsy just to try to one-up the other guy and the other guy would be doing the same thing. Competition creates activity. Activity creates all of a sudden we have a scene. Without the rivalry, you would have never seen the same level of production or interest or anything. The answer groups were a struggle because as much art as there was and as much as people did like to do art, um, the competition was always to not only get the best art but get, to get the most amount of art because people would judge you on you know, if you had like tw 20 pieces of art, even if they're fantastic, people would go, oh, that's a weak month for you. So you had to be able to get the art out. And if you got the art packs out, you know, maybe a day late or two days late, people would start criticizing you right away. They'd say, oh my God, they took, you know, an extra day or an extra two days to get the art pack out. Like, what are they doing? Maybe they're falling apart. Every month, I mean, the, the competition was the point where both groups would come up with their packs on the first or the second of the month. And then you'd have a series of electronic magazines that would come out and would rate all the packs and decide who was the winner of that month. And, I mean, this was fierce competition. You talk about having one bad antsy bring the pack average down, or, you know, people would get excited about this one artist having this one fantastic antsy that month. It would be all the talk, all the magazines would feature it. And, I mean, it was really, really competitive. Competition was amazing between groups. And at one point in time, I must say, it did become a little uh, warped, if you will, because it was more of who could get who to join whose group. And some of it became, between some of the groups, it became who's putting out better packs. But it was to put out better packs to attract better talent. If they could find what seemed like a more friendly place or what seemed like somewhere where people cared more about them or cared more about their art or were willing to teach them more, they were ready to hop ship to another group you start to join a group, you're in a group, you make a name for yourself, and then you jump to better groups. And it was always kind of, what can I achieve in the art in the art uh, scene? Start on a small group, get some attention, then you go to a bigger group. Then it was, mm, maybe I can move to a bigger nationally known art, art group. I mean, I'm like, oh, I want to be in your group. Like, I was like a local lamer. I was just like, you know, oh, yeah, I'd love, you know. I, mean, I would love to re you know, hear that conversation. I was probably just like... I mean, and the thing is, th th there were a lot more. I mean. The, the, about like, I guess the, the ANSI and ASCII scene, there were tons of groups. I mean, you have the Blade, CIA, Union was a huge one. The Valiant, there's Legend. The Gothic and Rock was Rulers of Chaos, that was my group. Vor was Vision of Reality. I mean, there, there's just been numerous art groups, Legion, I, that you could just go on forever. And you know, people, that was like the, Thing. Everyone wanted their own little art group, and there were so many people that it actually filled it all up. I mean, dependent on your skill level.
there's very few leaders in the world. There's a lot of followers. And there's very few people that will actually take the initiative to go and do all the work that it takes to actually put together a group like an ANSI group. Because a lot of people that ran ANSI groups were, were early teens. I know when I, when I got into actually running ICE, I think I was like 14 years old, 13, 14 years old. And it's kind of hard to, you know, manage anything at 13 or 14 years old, let alone a group of maybe about 100 people. I mean, being senior staff back then was so much work. I mean, I was, I took one summer, thankfully I was like 15 years old, so it wasn't a big deal, but one summer I didn't have a job and I just sat every day calling people, getting new artists, arranging, you know, organizing the pack. Um, I mean, it was like, I spent so many hours just running the group. By that point, uh, you have no life whatsoever, right? <laughs> It was a lot of work that went into this. Putting together an art pack is not an easy thing. It never was. Um, it took a lot of time. I had skipped many family vacations to put out asset packs. Um, some of the, you know, the biggest challenges were collecting all the artwork. Now being the world headquarters, that's where all the art had to end up. It had to end up there for the pack to go together. And we'd have inside uh, the world headquarters, obviously you can have different sections and based on your access to the bulletin board, you could have sections. Now being the world headquarters, if you were a rock member, you would get access to the rock area, which was special. And all uploads had to be there by this time here, and then I would put packs together. What that would entail was um, people uploading it to the, to the bulletin board closest to them, or if there wasn't an acid member board closest to them, a courier scheduling a time and working out a time to call them. And uh, we would always be in very close contact with all of our artists, always. Um, and it was always by phone. I mean, we would, email was nice if we couldn't get all of you, but ACID was a very social group. And so um, we would have conferences constantly. And we'd be like, hey, here's, here's what we're doing. Here's what, you know, this person's doing. And, you know, what are you doing right now? What kind of answer are you working on? And, which was always the biggest problem, <laughs> motivating people to draw. You know, nearing the end of the month, hey, it's a week before the release date. I don't have any art. <laughs> you know, I would start calling out people. I would start calling out people. I would do what Radman did. I would call their homes, call their work, get a hold of them, draw for the pack. It's coming out. You know this. You know it comes out every month. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, do you want to be in the group or don't you? Do you want to draw or don't you? If you don't, then fine, it's okay. Just let us know. It's because it's not like the internet where you have email, you send an email and it goes right to that person. And then if you want to send a mail to somebody, you had to make sure that you were on the right board that they were on also. You also had to make sure that you were on the board that they probably would check it sometime. Uh, sometime in the near future so you could leave them a message and start collecting art. You know, I'd call someone on the phone and say, you upload this to this certain board and you upload it to this one. And so there's a lot of phone calls going on, but that's, we would get them to do those boards and from there it would sort of spread out. Couriers who wanted to join, um, they had to have, you know, we would ask and expect them to have multiple phone lines, of course, um, multiple, as many as possible, you know, they could dial up multiple um, bolt boards at the same time if they had two computers and two modems, great. And it, it would be also a requirement that they have call waiting and um, three-way calling. It was a constant struggle. It was a constant struggle of, hey, hey, why don't you join my group? Hey, you know, whatever. We have these people. Oh, you know, it was a lot of offering. Like, oh, look, we have this really big name. And that person would go like, oh, wow, you have that guy in your group. And it's like, yeah, I can let you actually talk to that guy. <laughs> I can let you actually, like, he might actually give you a tip or something. He might actually take your ANSI and do take a look at it and maybe make a change or two and show you how you can make it better. And they'd go, oh, my God, oh, my God, let me come into the group or something like that. We, we've had, we had episodes where... You know, one artist did not get along with another artist, and they're both very two extremely talented artists. And one would be like, you know, I'm gonna quit if uh, if you accept this artist in. And we we didn't tolerate that kind of attitude, you know. And, and you know, if they couldn't give a really good reason, supporting reason why, we'd be like, you need to get over it, or understand that this person's better, and you can just go ahead and quit. There was one artist in particular who it gets really messy, but he was having a relationship with another, with a, a woman who was in our art group. And he was married, this was an on the side thing, and when they broke up, he told us that it was either we had to get rid of her or we had to get rid of him. And she was not known as being a particularly fantastic artist and he was like one of the top guys in the art scene. And I didn't even consult with the other senior staff, I just said, okay, bye superstar, you know, we're, 
if you give me an ultimatum, no chance. And so we got rid of him. Whether it's the guy who's running the group taking advantage of all the artists so that he has some additional access, or it's the artist going back to the local AC and saying, hey, I'm a big important underground art scene guy, uh, call my board, do whatever it is. It's like that whole class structure. There was a brief period where I actually said yes, I would join ICE with the, with the caveat that I would still be an acid. I forget who I was talking to at the time, but I think that caused quite an uproar, I think. Radman called me up and some other folks from some conference and they're interrogating me, you know, about like, did you really join ICE? What was this all about? And, you know, could, you can't tell me this isn't true. You know, he seemed really heartbroken by it and so I, I said, yeah, there was this time, there was this call and this guy, I forget the guy who, who asked me to be, and he's like, it's cool if you're still an ass, just be an ice and just put, you know, make us a logo or once in a while. It really was good versus evil. It was acid versus ice. It was the single, you know, evil tyrant versus the collection of people who were trying to do the right thing. If you ran a BBS and you were involved in the art scene, or not even involved in the art scene, even if it was like pirating software, wares, uh, you know, whatever it may be, you knew of Acid. Acid was the basically the the entity of the art scene, the whole thing in, in uh, its compilation. I don't know if everyone saw it that way, but I think there was that whole that whole theme underpinning a lot of what a, a lot of what happened. Acid always won. Ice was always number two, no matter what they ever did. Do you think it was their fault or just Acid was that good? No, it, it was just that, you know, Acid was always one step ahead of Ice, like and Ice just, you know. Yeah, my thought is, one of the clips that you played for me about uh, Acid always being a step ahead of Ice, I believe this would be totally untrue. <laughs> i just like to get that on tape. Acid! Yeah, I mean, yeah, I like Ice. I like Ice the most. I mean, they're the, they're the most popular ones. I mean, Ice came out with some great stuff, but even if they had a great pack that month, they just still didn't have the history Acid had. And while Acid was very good, I, I really think it was pretty much an even, an even battle between the two. Um, I would have been believing that Acid was pretty much uh, at the center, pretty much of an evil group. <laughs> Acid has always, always basically been number one. That's what it amounts to. It's never been questioned. Ice questioned it. We're number one. No, you're not number one. Acid is number one. Acid will always be number one. Ice rules. Acid sucks. <laughs> you had done a lot of time on your hands to be able to do it because ANSI was such a slow, slow process. Especially to do very good ANSIs, it was, it was a very slow process. You know, I work half an hour here. Sometimes I'd get like a whole stretch of like five hours in a row. Like I just surround my computer with, you know, munchies and, and whatnot, and uh, and I just haul on it. And then you know, some of the pieces, like the bigger ones, like if they're like 600 lines, which is pretty large. Uh, you know, it took me months. You know, doing this every so often, I'd make something else, and I'd probably be making something else at the same time. The longest ANC that I ever worked on, I think, was actually two months of really like working on it, not just like two months where I'd have like two week breaks in between. But I'd really like you know be doing a little something to it every day. And it took me two months to finally get all the blocks right, and, you know, <laughs> get all the colors in each block right, and get the little shading between it and everything. What made ANSI was the, like how creative you were with it. You almost had to like trick it out into doing things that you wanted to do, because I mean it wasn't just a matter of placing blocks. Like you had to know. I mean, it was a while ago. But you had to know like. To, to truly be a good anti artist, you had to do a few of them. Like, you, even if you were very talented, a talented artist, probably, I would say, a third of any ANSI is just being technical enough to, to know how to trick the, the ANSI code into to creating, like, the effect you wanted to, to create. We had 15-inch monitors, which are 14 or 15, which were, like, you know, pretty much standard, you know, that was what you had. And so the screen was obviously cut down in size. Now. Whenever I drew a piece, sometimes I would sketch something out on like a piece of paper and you know and go from there just so, so I can get the, the general concept of it and then translate it to the, to the ASCII or ANSI. But then uh, one day I, I totally like neglected my computer, you know, like people like clean them off like constantly, you know, fingerprints annoy the hell out of, out of them. Well, I let the actual like dust build up on my screen so there'd be a film of dust all on there. And it was like, I mean, it's a horrible thing to do to your computer, but 
what I would actually do is take that dust and I would trace in like a, a logo or like or start a picture. So then it would have it like in the dust and all I had to do is trace it with the actual ANSI characters. They, they use different characters on the keyboard to like sort of represent like, like a, you know, a four, the way a four is shaped. Like they can use that to make a curve or something like that, or like a like a a B would be like you know it's shaped like like this, and that would sort of like be like a curve going down, you know what I mean? And they'd have dollar signs and things like that to really bring out textures. What it is is taking taking away the restriction of a letter and turning it into art, basically. It's you know it, it's can I take an A and can I remove you know, let's say you take like a capital A, so you have the, the upside down V with a cross through it, right, a bar. Let's say, can I take away the bottom half of that and have it still look like an A? Can I stretch it out, make it oblong? Can I make it, you know, how can I twist and shape this letter to suit my needs and what I want this piece to look like and still have it somewhat legible? As you progress, you stop looking at it so much as letters, but more of this is the, the foundation of what it will look like in the beginning, you know, and then in the end, this is what it's going to look like. It's more of a foundation. The letters are a foundation. They're not the main point of the piece, so to speak. Basically, ripping is when you're, when you're taking somebody else's artwork and taking credit for it, you're ripping them off. To rip someone's artwork was a huge, huge problem. It can be as simple as just <laughs> changing out the name and putting your name on it and you know, seeing if you get away with it. And... Style ripping is a very huge aspect of the ASCII art. And style ripping is almost, it's almost like committing murder in the scene. Ripping was actually, that was probably um, through the art scene. Uh, that was the lowest form of art, actually, um, you know, taking somebody else's piece and manipulating it so it's, it's yours, but it's, it's really not. I actually experienced a time when one of my members stole uh, a, a font from another group and put it in our pack with his name on it. And I sent that out to everyone, all our distribution sites, everyone to review and rate, and someone came to me saying, your members, your members stealing. What are you talking about? Now there were so many art groups out there at the time, there was no way in hell that I was going to be able to check everything. I had to take the word of the person. Did you create this stuff? And it was pretty obvious you don't submit something that's not here. Yeah, the ethics. Um, and this person specifically did. And I remember, I remember uh, in the next month when I found out, formally apologizing to the group saying, I, I'm sorry this happened. I was unaware of it. I would not do that. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to make incredible art and try to recruit people to have a good time, but to uh, provide high quality art. And uh, I apologize. And I remember writing apologizing and then telling him to fuck off out of the group as well. We always had rumors of people ripping and we would always have to investigate it. Um, and generally, I would go into it siding with the ice artist and looking for conclusive evidence that they actually did something wrong. Because um, a lot of times I, I think the, the ripping charges were um, definitely people got really overworked over something that was really small. People were so adept, like they would be able to sit there and notice those things, like a basic line structure, or even down to the point of where the character strings in order to make a curve. Like some people would use like a pound sign that goes to a power sign and so on and so forth. And that was like the way that people did those things was their signature style. The way that things formed, the, the characters they used was what it was like what built it. Because that's what creates your style, your personal style. Is this is how I do the corner of a D. It's it's that that type of minutiae that distinguishes you from another artist. It's it seems I don't, it seems ridiculous in, in some to some people it would it would seem ridiculous that that you know there's you can take two D's that look almost the same yet the fact that one has a certain type of curve on it you can look at it and go it's that artist as opposed to this is that artist. 
Um, there was one guy named um, Trauma who ripped other ICE members' artwork in his and had a web page where he was just taking pictures from other ICE members and saying it was all his artwork. And um, <laughs> another senior staffer, uh, Mass Illusion, his way of dealing with that was to call the kid's dad and tell them that his son was was uh, infringing copyrights on the internet and his dad wrote a check to pay and his son lost net access for a while but then trauma came back and reapplied to the group with a different name and I was looking through his personal information and I remembered his phone number because of that episode where we were calling his dad and I looked it up and it was him reapplying with more ripped artwork to get back into the group again how would one do that without being caught? You're always caught. You're always caught because people look and anybody that looks at ASCII art with any sort of regular um, regularity, basically, they uh, they would know. They would know. I mean, entire entire packs have been devoted to pointing out that you know this person style ripped this person. Chances are, if you're ripping off ripping off an acid antsy, somebody's gonna know, and we're gonna find you pretty quickly, and we're gonna find out everything about you pretty quickly, <laughs> um, depending on um, what you're trying to do and what you're trying to gain from passing yourself off as an acid artist. You know, because basically what you've done is you've taken something that someone has created out of their own mind and taken it from them. It's like taking their child. Yeah, so I was never a, a, a huge artist. My, my main function was to organize the members of, of, of groups. And uh, at this point in time, there was another group called Triad. Canadian group. And um, we, started, we started getting communications from them here and there. And they actually approached us and said, we're looking to expand and they were having problems attracting U.S. members. Uh, so all of a sudden I started talking to their president and vice president on phone calls. Uh, the issue was, how do we merge the group and keep our name? How do we keep rock? We've got a name for ourselves. What can we barter? And this one in the negotiating skills. It's quite amusing to be you know, 17 year old negotiating with someone in Canada about how you're gonna uh, merge an art group, who gets what and why. And uh, some of the things that were negotiated were the world headquarters. That was very, very, very important to these guys. They went at world headquarters. So my board, too fucking hostile, I gave it up and said, you can have world headquarters. Okay, we want to keep our name. What do you think about that? Whew, that was a sticking point. So after negotiating and back and back and back and forth, I uh, kept the name Rock, merged them together, gave uh, the Canadian headquarters to them. They had a Canadian headquarters and they had a world headquarters. Uh, my board became the, this, the U.S. headquarters. Um, there was dual presidents. I was a president along with another guy. Uh, the one main thing that was very, very cool is that somehow I got to keep the name and I managed to keep control of releasing the packs. But it's, it's quite amazing to think about, you know, these people in our groups uh, negotiating mergers and acquisitions with artists in our groups. I always find that quite amusing. It was, you know, it wasn't an easy decision to make because we had to cut people, you know? We had to say, you know, we're not doing this anymore. Um, you can still contribute to ACID. You don't have to do ANSI, but we're just not going to allow ANSI anymore. After we lost BBSs, the whole scene really fell apart just because um, I think it had partially to do with the lack of a hierarchy on the, on the web, that there wasn't any rigid boards or groups. I'm sure they felt alienated by it, you know. Um,
for a long time I've always, uh, I guess worried maybe isn't the right word, but you know, hoped that what happened wouldn't be lost because I think it's historically significant in a lot of ways, the whole BBS scene in general. My art group is dead because I'm not there anymore. I mean, it's not my art group anymore, it's someone else's. You know, I'm talking to all these people all over the world um, with, you know, like-minded ideas who are really interested in computer art, specifically ANSI art. Um, what more could you want? I mean, that's, it just sounds insane. I mean, the whole community sounds absolutely insane when it's heard by somebody who really has never heard or known about BBSs and what possibly goes on with, with online communities. There was rivalries based on like nothing but I want to be, I, I can't really explain it. See, that's how complex it is. I really couldn't put it in words. It has been so important to so many people for so long. And it really does belong on museum walls as far as I'm concerned. It's almost incomprehensible how much time and effort was spent on drawing little colored blocks. I mean, I know that in the later days it sort of became popular to talk about doodle boys and doodling antsy and things like that and sort of demean it in a fun way. But I mean, really, it is a silly pastime in a silly medium that has no practical use whatsoever other than to maybe get yourself, you know, 10 or 15 bucks from someone who will pay for your antsy or to get your access to wares. Dude, I got and 40 to 50. to send to each other from one telegraph operator to another mm -hmm. around the country or around the world. And they sent them to each other. And that was teletype in those days. And eventually the radio amateurs were authorized to use teletype on the air. And so we started typing to each other. And of course, the minute that meant we got a teletype machine to begin with which meant that we probably had a thing that would punch tape and read tape. And so we found out that these telegraph guys who had been sending pictures for years before we ever got into it, mm -hmm. had tapes around in their lockers and God, they were buried. I had them dig them out. You know, I went around and found guys that had them and they would give them to me. I would get, I don't know how they would get interested in it. You know, they'd say, so what, you know, I, hell I can do blah, blah, blah with a computer. So. That, uh, that time is gone. the originals and once we got it we could send it to any other radio amateur anywhere in the world so it was a kind of an exclusive group really uh, it wasn't the average uh, CB operator or anything like that right. because we had to hook up a machine and figure out how to hook it up to our radio and build the circuits to convert the radio signal to the machine signal and vice versa every time you sent one there were 20 guys out there all punching tapes of it as they received it. And they would then go on the air the next day and talk to their other friends and send them to them. And it just it went on and on. So it just grew like topsy. The, the computers have basically wiped it out, you might say. I mean, it is, it's no big turn on for a young kid today. A young kid.
Most of the real activity in all of this, of course, occurred be BC before computers. It started out as the telegraph operators sent, they were on duty on, New, on Christmas Eve over the holiday. They had nothing to do. Nobody was sending a telegram out particularly. So they made up these pictures. <laughs>